This video is going to be about J values, otherwise known as coupling constants, and I've already indirectly referred to them in previous videos, and in particular, I spent a little bit of time showing you how I got them on the carbon multiplicity video, specifically how the carbon interacts with nearby H's. So I'm gonna start there because I've already done some talking there, but more often than not, the J values that you're going to be interested in are referring to this specific relationship between hydrogen atoms, which is to say hydrogens that are on adjacent carbons, and that is because this distance, one bond, two bonds, three bonds, so hydrogen to carbon, carbon to carbon, carbon to hydrogen, this three bond relationship is in many ways kind of the normal J value, the normal coupling constant, the normal relationship between hydrogens that we're going to see a lot of. So whenever you're dealing with normal multiplicity, and you've got Pascal's triangle, and you're thinking of doublets, and triplets, and quartets, and pentets, and all that stuff, that's usually talking about how many three bond neighbors do you you have. And so this relationship right here is called vicinal alkyl, but it basically is the boring normal J value, boring normal relationship. And this is going to be on the order of seven hertz. So keep in mind, whenever I say hertz, what I'm talking about is a frequency measure. And so ultimately, this is really a measure of the energy. And so the real way to think about this is the presence of this hydrogen causes this hydrogen to split very slightly into two different energy levels. And again, the image that I consistently keep using for this is that you have a large magnetic field and the nearby hydrogen, the neighbor that's coupling, is either going to be aligned with that magnetic field or anti that magnetic field. And it's that difference that creates two new energy levels. And the gap between those energy levels is a very small energy. It's a very small amount of energy, but this is also the standard amount of energy for this sort of relationship. Okay, so when I first introduced this image, what I was talking about was how you had C13s interacting with the hydrogen that they are actually bound to. And so in this particular case, you'd be talking about a hydrogen that is actually on the carbon of interest, and therefore there's a one bond relationship between this hydrogen and this carbon. And in the context of the NMR that we were looking at, the C13 NMR, it turned out that these values were on the order of 160 hertz for most of the hydrogens we looked at, and in one case was more like 120 hertz. Either way, you'll notice it's two or of magnitude different than this one. It's wildly different energies. And why is that? Well, because this is directly bound to the carbon of interest, and that's going to be a much larger effect than three bonds away. So the other thing to keep in mind here is the value, the energy, is going to go down with distance. And so if you have a relatively large amount of energy for being directly bound, it won't surprise you at all to note that when we had a two bond gap in the C13, that all of a sudden we had dropped down to seven eight-ish hertz or so. And if you had a three bond gap, sometimes it was seven or eight, but it could be a little bit less and so on and so forth. So anyhow, in the C13, the big gaps are going to be when the hydrogen is directly bound and all of this other stuff is going to be relatively smaller. In the proton, this is the gap that shows up most often, but that doesn't mean that this is the big gap. So now let me illustrate what common J values you might expect to see are in the proton NMR. So here in the context of straight chain alkanes are the three most interesting things to look at. The one I've told you about already is the vicinal alkyl, which is to say a three bond relationship between the hydrogen atoms. And when you have that three bond relationship, that is on the order of seven hertz. So six to eight hertz, give or take, usually. And so as long as you have a straight chain alkane, this is kind of the normal relationship, the one that you see. If instead you have a four bond relationship between hydrogens in a normal, typical straight chain alkane, that's too far. You usually cannot see that. The distances is too great so that the J value becomes so small that you can't see it. Maybe on the order of half a hertz or smaller. This tends not to show up. You tend not to see it. So seven hertz, usually invisible. Then of course, the only other one that's interesting is what if the two hydrogens are bound to the same carbon, in which case they are showing up as being two bonds away from each other. And what's weird about this is ordinarily two bonds on the same carbon doesn't show up. So you typically don't see these. But if there's something else in the molecule that's causing these two to show up in slightly different environments, namely if the two hydrogens in questions are diastereotopic, that's really the only case in which this tends to happen, then you might see a 
12 to 18 hertz coupling between them. They are on the same carbon, they affect each other greatly because they're right next to each other, and so you'll see a relatively large J value. Now this is not the only range, I've seen 10 hertz, I've seen a little bit more, but 12 to 18 hertz is a good general rule, and again this only shows up if the two hydrogens are different for whatever reason, and often what that means is that there's stereochemistry in one of these R groups. So now we have to examine what happens if you have a double bond in the way, and the reason why this matters is this helps the two hydrogens communicate more effectively. Having that pi bond in between really cranks up the amount of energy that, that these two can share, the way they can interact with each other. If we're looking at this blue hydrogen and comparing its relationship to all the other hydrogens, let's start with the trans one because this has the largest relationship. So the gap here, and this is again a three bond relationship, but because there's a double bond in the way, this really cranks up the energy involved. It's not going to be seven hertz anymore, it's going to be on the order of, in this case, 12 to 17 hertz for the trans sort of relationship. So if the relationship between the two hydrogens on the double bond is trans, then what you get is a 12 to 17 hertz-ish. And again, it doesn't have to be within that range, but that tends to be what you see. If instead what we are looking at is a cis relationship between the hydrogen in question and its neighbor, once again you have a three bond relationship, but now they are locked on the same side of this double bond. And when you have that cis relationship, then this tends to be more in the range of say 8 to 12 hertz. So again, a relatively large value compared to 7, but substantially smaller than trans. As you can actually tell a trans coupling from a cis coupling. Why? Because the J values tend to be different. And again, there's a little bit of overlap there, but in general, the smaller the J value, the more likely to be cis, and the larger the J value, the more likely to be trans. And you're usually not confused about what you're looking at, because being bound to an isolated double bond puts you in a chemical shift somewhere in the 5 to 7 range, and so then it's relatively easy to interpret the J values that you're looking at. This relationship right here, where they're on the same carbon, so 1 to 2, 2 bond relationship between these two hydrogens, this is now going to be known as geminal, but vinyl. And ironically, this ends up being a tiny J value on the order of 1 to 2 hertz. I have no good explanation for that. It seems to me like it should be higher, but in practice, it always ends up being tiny. So that's the way that double bonds work. But now comes the really complicating factor, and that is that if you have a relationship between this hydrogen and a hydrogen that's four bonds away, but there's a double bond of some variety in the way, all of a sudden you can now transmit that coupling information across a longer distance, and this ends up being one to two hertz as well. So this would be a four bond coupling as opposed to a three bond coupling, but it shows up often enough that you should be aware that this happens. If there's one take home message from the entire J value discussion here, it's simply that it tells you something about the relationship between the neighbors. The standard relationship is going to be seven hertz. If you see something that deviates from that, it might be a geminal vinyl, they may be trans to each other, they might be on the same carbon and alkyl, so geminal alkyl, etc. You learn some information by looking at the J values, which is why they offer substantial value. They are, however, fairly annoying to extract from the spectrum, and they are what make the spectra look complicated. Because the dirty little secret of what we taught you about multiplicity is it only works if you have fundamentally the same kind of J value along the way. If all of the J values that the single hydrogen you're looking at are shared, then you get a nice singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet, that sort of relationship. The M plus one rule only works if the J values of everything you're looking at are about the same. Now it turns out, more often than not, they're close enough so that's the way it kind of works, but they don't have to be. So the thing we showed you first is actually the exception. The more general cases are the way it w looks a lot of the time. However, the thing we showed you first happens often enough that it's actually a really useful thing to start with. To finish off this J's video, I'm going to use a specific real example in the NMR spectrum, and it's going to be ethyl vinyl ether. So ethyl on this side, vinyl on this side. And I'd like you to take a moment and do some quick predictions as to what you expect this to look like. So integration, chemical shift, and multiplicities. Ideally, what you came up with resembles this, with three peaks in the general alkene region, so around five to six maybe, and you'd expect each one of them to integrate for 1H. We'll talk about multiplicities later. You would also expect to see a quartet around 4 ppm that integrates for 2, and a triplet around 1 ppm that integrates for 3. Here, what I would like to point out is that peak A right now, you would expect to have two neighbors, namely B and C, except that you would expect B and C to affect it 
differently. So rather than showing up as a triplet, it's going to be a doublet because of C. It's also going to be a doublet because of B. Therefore, you expect it to be a doublet of doublets. If the two doublets are the same, then you end up with a triplet sort of peak. But if the doublets are different, then you'd have two doublets. Therefore, a doublet of doublets. The same analysis holds for B, by the way. It has two neighbors, A and C. It's going to be a doublet because of A. It'll be a doublet because of C. Therefore, a doublet of doublets. C, likewise, two neighbors. Therefore, doublet of doublets. In terms of actual J values that you'd expect, you would expect proton A to have a trans relationship with proton B, which means that you would expect to see a 12 to 17 hertz coupling showing up in each peak. Meanwhile, A and C, you expect to have a cis relationship, so you'd expect to see an 8 to 12 hertz coupling showing up in each peak. B and C are related to each other by a small geminal vinyl coupling on the order of 1, 2, or 3 hertz, somewhere in there. And then, of course, you'd expect to see the normal boring vicinal alkyl coupling that shows up in both peaks D and E on the order of 7 hertz. And so at a first pass, when you glance at the proton NMR for the spectrum, you see a quartet right around 4. You see a triplet right around 1. The triplet integrates for 3. The quartet integrates for 2, both of which make sense. What would be odd is the chemical shift of these, but if you think about resonance in the context of NMR, you'll come up with an explanation for why that is the case. If we zoom in quartet as well as the triplet, what you see is that they share J values, and it turns out that the J values associated here are on the order of 7 0.0 hertz. So each one of these lines in the quartet is 7 hertz apart, and that shows up as the same number in the triplet. And that makes sense. The reason why this is a quartet is because it has these three hydrogens as neighbors. The reason why this is a triplet is because it has these two hydrogens as neighbors. And we expect the normal three bond relationship, the, the vicinal alkyl relationship between these two, to, to have a J value of about 7 hertz plus or minus 1. So that makes sense. What's perhaps a bit trickier to understand is these odd multiplicities, but if you think of them all as being doublets of doublets, then that will help make sense. So this particular proton, which of course turns out to be proton A, has both a 14 hertz coupling and a 7 hertz coupling. The 14 hertz is squarely in the range of a trans coupling, and the 7 hertz is a little bit on the low side, but is generally consistent with a cis coupling. And we know again that this is the peak that has has both a trans and a cis in it. You will note that these two peaks share a 2 hertz coupling, which means that they are connected to each other. They are each other's neighbors. They're sharing that. But the 14 hertz coupling that shows up in this peak and also shows up in peak A tells you that this, therefore, is the trans relationship to this peak because they share a trans style J, J value. Here, of course, what we have is a 7 hertz coupling, and that then suggests that they share a cis relationship to each other. So again, the J value that shows up in both tells you that these two peaks are neighbors and the size of that J value tells you their relationship. So these two are cis to each other in the actual molecule. And then of course these two share a small coupling and in this particular case that corresponds to a geminal vinyl. So these two are bound to the same carbon and it is an sp2 style carbon. Therefore we can go ahead and assign, confidently assign, every peak in the molecule, some on the basis of chemical shift and integration and other strictly on the basis of the J values that they experience.